is responsible for regulating the workers' comp system in Texas, the system by which injured employees receive benefits. But one of our other key duties is to promote safe and healthy workplaces to try to keep people from getting hurt on the job. So we really appreciate the opportunity to partner with the National Safety Council with this webinar series to talk about occupational driving safety programs. Today we're going to cover, uh, focus on the driver and what employers should consider when they're developing their program when it comes to the driver. For those of you who attended or yeah, who attended last week's webinar, some of these first slides are going to be repeats, but I do want to cover them um, briefly for those of you who were not able to attend last week's webinar. So when we look at driving on Texas roadways, here are some statistics from the Texas Department of Transportation for 2014. Um, you can see that over 3,500 people died on Texas roads in, in crashes last year. There were no days last year where, where nobody died on the road, and actually um, we're coming up on about 15 years since the last day that nobody died on a roadway in Texas. And I looked at the TxDOT website this morning, and as of today, 2,729 people have died so far this year. And if you were listening last week, I mentioned the number last week, and then there have been 67 more fatalities in the week's time since our last webinar. So it's a really serious concern for all of us who are out on Texas roads driving for personal and professional reasons. The purpose of this webinar series is to help employers understand why they should focus on driving safety if they have people that drive for them on their job and you know what what should be included in an occupational driving safety program and, and how they can go about developing that, what information is available to them. The reason we are focusing on transportation outside of those statistics I just showed you from TxDOT, when you look at the Bureau of Labor Statistics occupational fatality data, transportation incidents are the leading cause of work-related fatalities in Texas, and there are lots of different occupations and industries that require employees to drive as part of their job functions. And in a lot of cases, driving on the road is probably going to be the most dangerous thing that your employees might do for you while they're working. <clears throat> so here are some data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. As I mentioned, the leading cause is transportation incidents, a full 45% were transportation incidents. There were 524 total fatal occupational injuries in 2014. Those are preliminary uh, data that were recently released, and 237 of those were transportation incidents. Another um, startling fact is that 57% of those transportation incidents involved occupations that were not motor vehicle operators. So a lot of these people who are employees who are um, victims in these crashes, Driving is not necessarily their main occupation or their main job duty. It's something they're doing outside of whatever their normal job is. And we, when we look at the BLS data, we also see that almost 4,000 cases in 2014 were not fatal, but they involved days away from work as a result of the injury. So we want to encourage employers to limit the risk to their employees and to their company by um, developing occupational driving safety programs that address the hazards that are associated with that, have written programs in place and, and review those programs on a regular basis, just like you would with any other uh, written program, safety program that you have in your workplace. We think it's really important that employers think about the road as an extension of their workplace, as we talked about in detail last week. So today we're going to talk about the driver, as I mentioned. The other two components that are um, essential in a occupational driving safety program are the vehicle and environment, and we'll be talking about those next week. When we look at the driver, these are the things we're going to talk about today. As employers, I think, tend to assume that employees that come to work for them, if they have a driver's license, a valid driver's license, then they're, if they have good driving habits or they're capable of driving, whatever the case may be. And that can be a mistake if employers aren't really thinking about the task at hand 
and the person's ability to drive when they are driving as a part of their job for their work. You know, a lot of employers will train their employees on how to do different types of job functions, job tasks in their workplace, skills that are needed, you know, within the brick and mortar part of their workplace, but they may not really think about the driving skills themselves, which we're going to cover today. First, we'll talk about distracted driving. This is a big topic. A lot of people are talking about this both from uh, an uh, use of electronic device standpoint and other standpoints. Obviously, driving is a very dangerous activity, and being alert and focused on what the task at hand is really important for employees when they're driving. The National Safety Council actually has a really good white paper called Understanding the Distracted Brain, and I encourage you to read through that. I'll show you a link to it here at the end of my presentation. But it's a really good document that explains what physically happens with the brain when somebody is distracted while they're driving. Of course, use of cell phones and electronic devices is one thing, but there are, just, there are lots of different kinds of distractions, and we'll talk about those. But a lot of times when a person is distracted when they're driving, they suffer from what researchers call inattentive, inattention blindness. In other words, they they are looking out the windshield and they're seeing things, but it's not registering in their brain and they're not comprehending it because they're distracted. Most people can understand or realize when they're physically distracted, maybe their hands are off the wheel when they're using a cell phone or when they're um, visually distracted. In other words, they're not looking at the road, they're looking at something else in the vehicle. But a lot of drivers don't often understand or comprehend that they are cognitively distracted when when they're um, either talking on the phone or doing other things in the vehicle. They don't really realize that they're not paying attention to everything that's around them and their surroundings. So any anything that is done in the vehicle besides driving is a distraction. So obviously use of electronic devices, as we've discussed, is a big no-no. I know we've probably all seen people in a vehicle next to us doing any number of these other things that I have listed here, all of these take the driver's attention off, off the road and away from the task at hand. So we really want employers to talk to their drivers about these types of distractions, train them about what the employer's expectation is when it comes to distracted driving, what you um, are willing to allow or not allow while employees driving a vehicle, try to prevent these things from taking away from the employee's ability to drive. Seatbelt use is very important. We do want to ensure that any employee who's driving a motorized vehicle, be it a car, a forklift, a piece of equipment, whatever kind of a, a motorized vehicle it is, that they're wearing the restraint that's appropriate for that type of vehicle. You can see here some TxDOT data about crashes where people were unrestrained and, and sustained fatal or serious injuries, over 2,500 people. And your chances of, of avoiding an ejection really increase greatly if you do wear your restraint, your seatbelt. So we do encourage that. Impaired driving is obviously going, you know, if a person is impaired, it's obviously going to affect their ability to drive. Impairment can be caused by alcohol, illegal, illegal drugs, which is what we mostly think about, but it can also be caused by prescription drugs and over-the-counter medications. So employees, you should be having conversations with your employees about if they're taking anything that may be legal, but it might affect their driving, that y'all have a conversation about that and talk about whether or not it's appropriate for them to be driving either while they're temporarily taking a medication or whether or not it's going to affect them. We also encourage employers to consider doing drug and alcohol testing for any employee who drives, but maybe as a pre-hire test and then with some regularity thereafter. It's not required, it's just a recommendation of ours. Certainly you want to probably look at that if an employee is involved in a crash 
but probably some regular testing could help mitigate any um, situations where you've got people driving impaired while they're on the job. We're going to talk a little bit about fatigue. I would like to share a, a brief video with you here. Um, you, you may have seen this before. It's on YouTube. It's real brief, so I'll, I'll start it now. So you can see this um, driver was falling asleep. You can see his eyes, you know, closing. And he, just for a microsecond, he closed his eyes, and then there was a hazard, obviously, in the roadway in front of him. And he tried to correct that, and you see what the result was. He ended up crashing. And there's another another reason I like showing this video is because he wasn't wearing a seatbelt and you see, saw where he ended up in the vehicle. So fatigue can be just as dangerous as impaired driving. Your reaction times are, are diminished and it's, sleep can overcome a person really quickly without them realizing it. So it's really important for employers to think about if employees are fatigued, do they need to be driving for you? You should consider the, you know, if, if you've got people working long hours, long shifts, and then you're expecting them to drive after that, especially for any length, you know, length of time, that can be particularly hazardous for them. It's probably not a good idea. It's also good to talk to your employees about that are driving, um, why it's important to get a good night's sleep, why it's important to not be on the road while they're fatigued. So that's a training element that we do think employers should cover using with their employees. Just, and then just some general discussion about wellness and being fit to drive. Um, you know, a lot of times when employees come to work in the morning, we don't necessarily know what they did the night before on their own time. <clears throat> so you want to make sure that you tell your employees that you expect them to be ready and able to drive when they come to work. You want to talk to them about what their capabilities are. You want to look at their job descriptions. If part of their job is going to be driving, you want to make sure that their job description specifies that, that they're able to see and hear and react to things while they're driving because those, those are the things that are going to help prevent crashes. You could also do job hazard analysis associated with driving, but we definitely want you to make sure that people that you have are putting behind the wheel to drive for you are in good health and capable of doing that to the best of your ability to have that conversation. Your occupational driving safety program should include a training element. As I mentioned at the beginning, you know, a lot of tasks that the employee does that are not driving related, you're probably going to provide them some training on them. So we want you to make sure that your driving program does have a training element where you train your employees on these types of behaviors that I've just talked about, but also on all your your company policies, the program itself, and go over all that and what the expectations are for your employees. The training should also explain the risks of driving and that you consider this function and the roadway as an extension of your workplace outside of your brick and mortar work site. The, dr the roadway is still part of the workplace and you train the employees on what you expect of them while they're driving. Of course, you know, we, you do want to cover driving techniques in your training, but we, we want to make sure that the message is getting across to the employees that you're as concerned about their safety on the road as you are when they're at your work site. So here are some minimum things that we think you should cover in your driver training, some of these key things we just talked about, and some of the technical aspects. Um, defensive driving, aggressive driving, ha some common causes of collisions, rear end collisions, backing, uh, maintaining the vehicle, driving in adverse weather conditions. And we're going to talk more about vehicle maintenance and weather and environment in the next webinar. But 
at, while we're talking about the driving training component of your program, we want to make sure that you cover all these elements and at some point when you are putting people behind the wheel to drive for you. We do have a checklist. I mentioned this last time, but for those of you who, are, who did not attend last time, we have a checklist to help employers evaluate their safety program and see if there are issues that they probably need to address in their workplace. I'll show you where that is on our website. If my Internet Explorer will work here. Here we go. So here's our driving safety website. This includes information from all these webinars that we're doing. And the checklist is right here. And it does basically include questions for you to ask yourself about your program. I'll get down to the driver section here. I'm not going to go through all the questions, but just kind of let you see what some of these are. Whether you answer yes or no to these questions doesn't necessarily mean that it's good or bad. We just want you to think about these, these types of things and how they're affecting your drivers and what you can do to address them in your workplace what kind of training you can provide to your employees to prevent these types of either behaviors or hazards in the workplace. This, this particular checklist does have questions about the other three components of an occupational driving safety program. And so I'm not going to show you all of those, but they're all included in this, in this checklist. These are meant to be provocative questions for you to just ask yourself and, and make a decision about whether or not you should address those in your workplace. This website also has a section for the driver, which covers all the things we just went over in this brief webinar. And it also includes links to different resources to help you with some of these training issues, um, some guidance. Here is the white paper that I mentioned from the National Safety Council, Understanding the Distracted Brain. So we have several links for these different areas that we talked about today to help you with your driving safety program and training materials, et cetera. And just to let you know, we also, when you, when you get to our main page, we do have a link here to last week's webinar. So if you missed that and you want to listen to that, it is recorded and linked here. This links to the National Safety Council's YouTube channel where they have it posted. So hopefully you'll be able to use some of these resources to help you prevent injuries in your workplace. The Division of Workers' Compensation also has a variety of other programs and services to help employers prevent injuries on a variety of other topics, not just driving safety. So we encourage you to visit our website at this link or give us a call or send us an email. We'd be happy to help you with that. And then just a reminder next week, same time, same channel, we'll be doing the last in this series of webinars. We'll be talking about the components of an, uh, an occupational driving safety program that cover the vehicle and the environment. So we hope you'll be able to join us for that. But those, it will be recorded just as this one and the previous one are, so you, you can, we'll have access to it if you need it. Does anybody have any questions? If you want to type in any questions in the chat, be happy to answer those. Somebody asked what the link was, so let me go back. So this, let me go back one more. This is the link to the checklist that I discussed. And this is the link, and by the way, this PowerPoint presentation will also be on the National Safety Council's website, the Our Driving Concern website, so you'll have access to that as well. This is a link to the driving safety page that I showed you, and then this here is a link just to our main workplace safety page where you can get information about our other programs and services. Any other questions? All right, well, we appreciate you taking part in today's webinar, and please do feel free to contact us if you need any assistance in implementing these types of programs in your workplace. Thank you. Just want to let Karen know that we greatly appreciate uh, her doing the webinar today.
Also, uh, you can go to texasdrivingconcern.org, and these will be on there, uh, the video. Uh, it is being recorded. There will be a video, and there will also be the, uh, the PowerPoint presentation available um, there. Um, and then we also, you know, you can also register for the next um, webinar, which you'll see here on this front page, November 5th, 10 a.m., and then we also have some um, uh, train the trainer opportunities on there as well. There's one uh, November 3rd in Austin and December 7th in Amarillo. So that concludes the webinar for today. I want to thank everyone for attending and hope you have a great safe day.